Well, morning everybody. Welcome to uh, Photoshop Friday. One second, let me just straighten this up. It looks a little bit wonky. I'm going to go seasick. Right, well, there we go. Is it going to work? There we go. Nearly, nearly there. Nearly there. With that. There we go. There we go. You know, it would have made sense to do all of that when I wasn't live, but here we are. Right. Um, hello. Welcome. I'm going to um, just waffle briefly whilst we're uh, waiting for a few more people to jump on the stream. We've got a yeah, got a few. Let me just click on this, double check everything seems to be working. Yeah, look, there I am. I'm in a little box. There's a picture all around us. If you guys are online now, do me a favor and go into the, wait a second, let me point in the right direction. The chat over there, um, just chime in, say hi, maybe where you are. If you're one of my students, that's ideal. Um, and if not, then look, words will happen anyway. Eventually I'll wake up and um, be able to speak in a continuous manner. Welcome to uh, Graphics Wizardry. My name's Phil. We're going to be going through some uh, Photoshop rendering stuff for product design. Um, I was going to say, in case you haven't seen this before and then explain what it is, but if you haven't seen this before, absolutely no idea how on earth you've managed to find yourself here. Like, welcome, <laughs> but you're going to be mildly perplexed by all of it. Um, my name's Phil. I'm a, um, uh, an HPL sort of guest lecturer on a product and industrial design course at Coventry University in the UK. Normally, on a Friday, I would be in the university in a lab with a bunch of students sitting there going through how to do a load of stuff in Photoshop. But um, we've just decided altogether not to do that for no real reason. Nothing's happening in the world at large that's made things worse. Um, but we're doing it. It seems like it's okay. I've made a bunch of um, streaming instructional videos in the past, so it seemed like it should be easy enough to switch over. I decided I wasn't going to come in at the weekend. And then after I'd done my first session, the university told everybody um, that they shouldn't come in either, presumably because my session was just so damn good that they thought everyone should uh, everyone should follow Phil's Phil's model on this one. So we're going to be going through um, how to render this thing that you can see. This graphic just hit some kind of weird handheld sensor device. Now. What I normally do, these techniques are obviously are applicable to rendering all kinds of different things. But um, in order for you guys to be able to follow through specifically with the uh, techniques that um, the techniques that I'm going to be doing today, then ideally you will be able to um, work on this exact file. So if you look in the in the, in the caption for this um, instructional video down there, there should be a um, there should be a download link. Let me just double check that there actually is a download link. Yeah, you have to click past the show more bit, and there's like a blue Google Drive. That's my Google Drive thing, and it's got um, this this um, crappy JPEG is in the Google link. So if you guys click on that, there kind of there is an optimal way for you to follow along with um, this session. The best way for you to follow along is if you get me here on YouTube and put me on your second screen. So if you've got your phone or if you've got a tablet that you're going to be able to use for this, get me on your second screen, put me down here somewhere next to your computer. And then on your computer, I want you guys to load up Photoshop and in your browser, um, you're going to need to get the the link that's on the um, on the description just here. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. All you need to do is get this file and download it. So I'm going to give you guys um, a couple of minutes in which to do that because otherwise it's going to be difficult for you to follow along. Now, what's nice about using YouTube like this is that because we're live, you guys can ask me questions. If you've got any questions about how any of what I'm explaining to you works, if it doesn't make sense, if I've not explained it properly, which is realistic, then you can ask the question on the YouTube chat. I've got that open on my other screen just here, so I'll be able to either answer it in the chat or spot what you've asked, 
pause what we're doing and follow along. This is not the same as us just me recording a uh, YouTube instructional video because that you can take at your own speed. This, I would just if I was gonna just plow through, it would take hardly any time. But what I wanna do is make sure that you've got time to follow along, okay? Because I need for this to be um, useful and interactive and for you to be able to get something from this. We need to maximize our time now because I'm out isolating. I think probably a lot of you guys are gonna be isolating. The world is not moving along at full steam not as it normally is if you were if you drop time away like this. So we've got an opportunity to try and like work on ourselves, develop our skills, like hone your chops and get good. So the best way for us to do that is for me to transfer some of my skills and uh, um, you're gonna have to ask questions. Somebody's just asked, oh, I was gonna say, um, wait a sec, let me just, we've got a couple of people on the, um, let me just grab this. We've got a couple of people who are on the Discord channel, and I need them to know that it's live here now. I think that there was a problem with the stream and a couple of people have dropped out. Um, somebody just asked whether the lesson has finished. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's even started. How can it have finished? If there's <laughs> I feel a bit like I'm shouting into the void, which is en entirely possible. If there's anybody on YouTube who's able to actually see any of what's happening, um, if you can hear me, then I want please just because <laughs> I still it looks like it's all running fine on my machine. If you could just drop a little message into the chat just to say like yes, it's working. The internet hasn't completely died in your shed, then that would be ideal. And we can plow on. So I did mention that if you're one of my students who's at um, the university, I should have emailed you guys. You should have got some kind of contact which has got. A, um, a link to an invite for a Discord server. Okay, yeah. Um, so we've got the Discord server, which is running in... Um... So I've just got to time something, something here. Okay, yeah. right. We're here, Phil. Got you. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I wasn't panicking at all, guys. Everything's fine. It's completely normal. Okay, so if you've got the Discord chat, get the Discord chat open in the background on your computer. The idea of the Discord chat is that if you get completely stuck, it looks like the audio is working, looks like it is working. You knew that because you were there and it's working. Um, if you get stuck with anything, then you can use a screenshot. You can post your work as you go along, which would be absolutely ideal. I'd love to see how um, anybody who's following along is getting. If you get completely stuck, then you can um, do a screen share. You can call me on Discord, and then you can screen share onto uh, Discord. So anyway, let me just click this. There we go. Back in the box again. I'm tiny. Right, thanks for letting me know that it's working. Now, hopefully, we're going to be able to get on with this now. So we've got Photoshop open. We've got the graphic open just here. Now, anytime that you open a, um, a uh, file like this in Photoshop, if it's just a flat JPEG, then it will come in, we've got the layers palette just here, and it will say background in italics and with a little lock on the right hand side. Now we're gonna work with layers and we're gonna build up the layers as we go. So we need to click on the lock, you can see that that pops it out from being the background, and we're gonna rename this layer sketch. Now it's really important as you're working through documents like this that you name all of your layers. Otherwise, what's gonna happen is, this isn't gonna be a particularly complicated document, but we're gonna end up, if you don't um, name your layers with like layer one, layer two, layer two, copy, layer two, copy two, Etc. Etc. And if you um, don't have some kind of nomenclature, if you don't have a naming system when you're making your layers, then you can end up um, with a document that is you can kind of process whilst you're working on. But if you need to come back to it at a later date, or if you're working in a studio, which is perhaps one of your goals, then when you hand your file over to somebody, 
it's kind of impenetrable for them to use. So I've had to deal with files from other people who haven't been particularly careful about how they work on their files, how they name their files. And that's fine if all you need to do is just to like print it out or if you're sending it to somebody. But if you need to actually open it up and do some work on it, and they've not organized their document in any sensible way, it can be a ginormous pen in the ass. So give your layers uh, names that make sense, that when somebody, ideally it's like if somebody opens your file up, they'll understand by looking at the layers what each one is. So anyway, blah, 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 we're going to name this one Sketch. Well, the way that we're going to work today is we're going to be using paths to create some masks. We're going to be making a bunch of different layers underneath the uh, sketch layer. And when we make layers underneath the sketch layer, we need for the sketch layer to be um, transparent so that we can see the sketch, but we can also see the layers underneath. So in order to do that, we're not going to reduce the opacity. We're going to click here where it says normal, and I'm going to select multiply from the um, transparency mode. So what that means is obviously nothing visually changes just here. But what's white on the sketch is now transparent, and the black of the lines is opaque. What I'm also going to do is, because when I've worked on this before with the students, every now and again someone will accidentally click on the sketch layer and start painting on there. Um, and it's a pain in the neck because you don't always notice until later on. So I'm going to lock the, the um, layer here. It's this little lock on the right-hand side. Lock all. And what that means now is that I can't accidentally work on this layer. So I'm going to make um, a new path set just here. And we're going to create a mask around the outside of the entire shape. Now, when you start using the pen tool, it by default will create a work path. Man, I've been through this so many times on all of my other things. We're just going to create a path set and we're going to give it a name that makes sense. We're just going to call it um, shape hole because I'm going to use the pen tool to trace the entire outside of the path uh, of the object. Now, a lot of people like might be familiar with using some of the other selection tools in Photoshop. I could use the magic wand tool. I could use this. Um, I can't remember what it's called because I don't use it very often. Auto select. What's it called? Quick selection tool to select the you know the outside of the object. But the reason why I'm not going to do that is because we're doing a particular kind of render which is going to be more accurate, ideally, than the actual object itself. Now, you guys who have been working through all of my sessions at the university and even people who have been running through the sessions on YouTube will be familiar with this approach. It's entirely reliant on you being um, good at using the pen tool. So something that comes with practice. Hopefully, you guys will be able to follow along. So I'm going to click P on the keyboard. And I'm going to make sure that I've got this shape hole path set selected here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to trace the outline of the entire outside of the object. So I'm going to start, let's say, up here. So you click and drag, you get the um, anchor points. And when you drag, you get the little handles that come out from them, which let you use what's called Bezier curves to weight those curves and distort the lines. So that lets us get these very nice, smooth, organic uh, kind of lines, which is absolutely perfect for an object like this, which is obviously quite smooth and organic. Well, it turns out I can't use Bezier curves and talk simultaneously, which is really inspiring, isn't it, guys? So when you're trying to make a shape like this, what you've got to do is use sort of as few a number of points as possible to define the shape. I've learned from watching students making shapes like this that if you're not familiar with using the tool, it's much easier to use lots and lots of points. Well, the problem with that is you often can end up with a shape that doesn't look nice and smooth. It doesn't look especially organic. Right, so we've got our shape just here. You can see that I've used a whole bunch of different points. Now, if I was just using, if I was just doing a, uh, like a YouTube video normally for myself, like I've done it now, so I could move on to the next step. But 
my goal is for you guys to be following along. And I know that this takes a little bit longer for um, everybody to find their own pace to, to follow along. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a little bit of a hold on this now. Um, and I want you, uh, anybody who is following along, first of all, if you get a chance, just make a little note saying, like, if there is anyone following along. I know from when we did the session on um, Tuesday, we did two sessions, there were a couple of people following along, but most people weren't. They're going to follow along in their own time. 100% fine, absolutely zero problems. You um, can always still ask questions. And even once we finish doing this live, obviously, because it's YouTube, it's going to be recorded. If you've got any questions, if anything doesn't make sense, you can always ask them in the comments on the YouTube then, rather than going into the chat, which you can do now, which is live, the comments, and I'll get a notification through YouTube Studio. I can drop in. I can um, answer any of the questions that you want. One of the other things is that you guys can use um, the captions, the comments rather, on YouTube. If there's something that you want me to cover in a future session, I'm going to be doing this for sort of the immediate foreseeable future for the next few weeks, certainly. Um, and if there's something that you guys would like me to cover, then I can make a session specifically about either a particular technique, a particular approach. If there's something that you want to do, if there's like um, uh, uh, an idea of something that you want to communicate in Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign, then we can do a session like that. Uh, also, I'm thinking about, because this is very specific to people who are using this particular software, this particular approach, you want to get this particular result, I'm thinking about figuring out a way to do the camera setup so that we can do some drawing tutorials, because um, a lot of people who are going to be able to tune in won't necessarily have all of the Photoshop and everything set up. But God, I hope that you've got some sheets of paper and some pens because you can do 99% of the work that you need to do um, in an analog way. And if there's any skill that you guys who are in isolation or in like social distancing, if there's any skill that you could easily, very cheaply develop that will make a genuine difference to your skill set and even your career trajectory. If there's something that you could come out of this process having learned, then drawing is something that would, I think, be realistic and very beneficial. I'm guessing actually no one is particularly following along. That's fine, so I'm gonna get on with the next part of this now. So I've got my shape hole just here. Um, let me just, just in case you're catching up, you've not been through using the um, pen tool before. First thing that you want to do is just play around with the pen tool to understand how it works. If you just click, 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 you're going to get a square shape like that with um, hard edges. If you click and drag, you're going to get a nice round shape like this. When you hover over and click on the last shape, uh, last anchor point, <laughs> yeah, then we, um, you get a closed shape. There's a few things that I'm going to show you real quick just now that are maximum useful. If you click and drag and you're drawing a curve like this, if you hold down the Alt key after you've pulled out like this, so it always makes parallel handles coming out. If you hold down the Alt key, you can deparallelize. Wait, hang on, what the hell word is that? Deparallelize the, yeah, the handles. I mean, it's not a word, but you know what it means. So you can make a corner which has still got nice round edges like that. Cool. The other thing that's quite useful when you're drawing these shapes is if you hold down space whilst you're pulling a handle out like this, it lets you move the part that you're working on. So if there's a ha um, an anchor point like this that's highlighted and I'm pulling the handles out and it's not quite right, I can jig it into space. Fine. Sometimes you're going to need to add anchor points because the shape you've got is not quite right. You can do it like this. As you hover over the line that's selected, it will add an anchor point. If you want to remove an anchor point, hover over an anchor point with a pen tool, a little minus will appear next to the cursor. You can see that just there. Boom, and it's gone. Now, if you ever want to move any of these around afterwards, if you press A on the keyboard, you will get the selection tool. That's just here. Either the path selection tool, which lets you select the whole shape and move it around, or much more useful, the direct selection tool, which lets you select individual anchor points and drag the handles around after the fact. Right, that's a crash course in the pen tool. You should know how to use that already. I just wanted to mention that just in case you didn't. I feel like it's the full package now, you guys. You can't complain that I've not explained it. <laughs> Yosho98 on uh, the Discord channel has asked, 
was going to ask on Tuesday, could we start back up the weekly sketching challenge? This is like a Facebook thing that I used to run for the university students. Um, yes, is the answer. Your show. I will start back up the weekly sketching challenge. I think that that would be pretty cool. Um, and I will try and tie it in with this. So I'll explain what we're going to do on the YouTube and I'll also post it up on the Facebook group for the students. Um, anyway, yeah, there we go. So once we've got our shape done in Photoshop here, I'm gonna make a new layer, drag it underneath the sketch layer. I'm gonna rename it because you've gotta name your layers, guys. If you don't name your layers, it's gonna be trouble. And I'm gonna call it shape hole, I guess, shape hole. I mean, that explains what it is. Right, I'm gonna use uh, a midpoint gray in this. Let me just real quick explain something that bugged me for a long time. This is something in fact, do you know what? I have no idea why this is still a bug in fact. Is it even a bug? It's either a bug in Photoshop or a feature that I can't even begin to understand why it is like this. So let's say, because I work in gray, we're gonna work in gray and then we're gonna add color at the end. So we're gonna start with a gray uh, midpoint gray. So let's say we start off with a nice midpoint gray I've selected grayscale from color here, just here, grayscale slider, 50%, right? Alt backspace, flood fills the entire layer with whatever the foreground color is, so it's this 50% gray here. Right, let's switch to a brush. I've got the brush tool just here. Whatever, large hard edge brush. Right, we've still got the same, for man, if this doesn't work now, I'm gonna look like such an idiot. We've still got the same foreground color. If I start painting now, whatever I paint should be completely invisible, right? Because we're painting 50% gray over 50% gray. Okay, and we've not got anything weird up here set, smoothing, no flow, 100% opacity, mode is set to normal. But what the heck is that? Right? What the heck is that? Why is it not 50% gray? That's the foreground color, 50% gray. What the heck is that, right? It's a disgrace. I don't know why it does this. I don't know why they've not fixed it. I've seen people complaining about it before on forums and things, so it's a known problem. And it's a mad problem. It's not even a small difference. Like, look, anyway. So, what I'm gonna do is, instead of using grayscale slider, okay, if you're working in an RGB file, don't use a grayscale slider. What you're gonna do is you're gonna drop down to HSB sliders. HSB stands for hue, so you can select what your hue is gonna be, saturation, which we're gonna to set to zero because we do want a gray, and brightness, which I'm gonna to set to 50%. Right. So we flood fill with 50%. Now I've got the brush selected, exactly the same brush settings as before, exactly the same color, 50% gray. And when we, I'm clicking now, you can even hear it, listen. And because it's painting 50% gray. Right. So like, there's no, there's no outcome for this. Like all I'm just saying is when you're painting gray, Whenever we're doing these sessions now, when you're painting gray in Photoshop, I want you to be using HSB as the sliders, okay? Do not use grayscale because it works in an unpredictable, weird way that I can't explain. If you know why it does that with the grayscale, please, absolutely, if you wanna make me look like an idiot because you know and I don't know, I desperately wanna know. So hit me up down in the ca uh, comments down there and tell me, oh, Phil, you idiot, don't you understand? Because I absolutely don't understand. So anyway, look, here we go. We've got our 50% gray. I actually don't wanna have, wait, no. I'm trying to delete the layer, but I've got the um, path selected here. Oh dear, I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> when, we, when we get to the end of this, and this looks pimp, just remember that sometimes it's a slightly, uh, it takes a couple of goes to get there. Make sure that you've got the layer selected, and make sure that you've got the path selected down here, okay? So, let me show you with this. We had a little bit of a thing with this yesterday. We need to make sure that the path that we've got is set like this. Exclude overlapping shapes. What that means is that when we have this shape selected here, we've got the layer selected here, we've got our 50% gray as a foreground color. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit fill path with foreground color, just here. So when I press that, oh, thank heavens. We've got our shape on a layer with a whole outline selected, okay? A 
So it looks okay, this is all fine. I'm going to make a new path set just here. And what we're going to do is we're going to create all of the masks first of all, and then we're going to actually do the painting, the rendering afterwards, because that's the, the rendering of the paint is like, that's the easy bit. So I'm going to call this um, front surface. So the way that we're going to do the render like this is the way that I usually like to do these renders. I'm going to break this up, this object, into all of its sort of continuous surfaces. So this is a continuous surface, this little, it's like a, I guess the rubber handle at the back. This um, top surface is a flat bit, that's a surface, the screen is a separate surface. So we're going to create masks for all of those, and that's going to let us um, do uh, sort of our airbrush rendering method. So I'm going to click P on the keyboard. So let me just deselect this a second. So I want to reduce the opacity because what I want to do is we're creating a piece of artwork that is more accurate than this crappy sketch. This crappy sketch is not accurate, whereas we're going to have a render at the end which looks okay. It's going to look really beautiful and accurate. So we need to create more accuracy. So we're going to use this as a guide. But I want this top surface to match exactly there because the line should follow perfectly round the outside of the overall shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click just here because you can see that's where the edge of the shape hole shape is. Click and drag, zoom out. Click just there. So my usual guide when I'm talking about exactly how to decide where to put your Bezier curves is that whenever your curve transitions either into, uh, your line rather, transitions either into or out of a curve. So we've got a curve there, point, curve there, point, and it goes from a curve, wait, the cursor's behind my face, there we go, sorry. From a curve to a straight line, so there's a, a point there where it goes from a curve to a straight line. The straight line, and then it goes from straight line to a curve, so you have a point there. Then it goes from a curve to a straight line, so you have a point there. And kind of like that's the way to decide where you're going to put your uh, your points. And so now we're going to go to match this curve as it goes to the edge of the object. So I'm going to put a point there. Uh, let me just move that a little bit. Yeah, that looks about right. Now, so I've drawn the front edge of that shape. Now what I could do is I could sort of like slavishly follow and try and match that back edge, um, and I will not succeed. There will be pixel mess. Even if I could get it absolutely pixel perfect, it probably wouldn't work exactly right for what I want to do. So what I'm going to do is I am going to ignore that shape, because we can go over it, right? Because you only ever need to do the front where your layers are going to overlap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, basically what I want is, I want to have just this top shape as a layer just here. So if I filled this now, it would fill that whole shape. There's, you're going to watch this and be like, oh, that's not, the, that's not the way I would do it. There's a bunch of different ways of doing these kind of selections. Okay, I just want to show you sort of one that's really quick and really easy. Um, and if we'd have done these in a different order, maybe you know, this maybe would have been better to do them in a slightly different order. But for what I want um, to do later on, this is kind of optimal. So I'm going to click on this. Um, make selection from path just here. So it converts this path into a selection. So you can see we've got these like the marching ants going around the shape just here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I'm on the shape whole layer. I'm going to click control C on the keyboard, which is going to copy that layer. So what it's done is it's copied the section of that layer that intersects with the shape underneath it. So it will be this gray shape. Then I'm going to click Control Shift V, okay? And what control? So Control V is paste. Everybody knows copy and paste. 
control paste and control V rather will always just paste it sort of into the center of the viewport or just offset, it always pastes it in a wonky place. What control shift V does, so say you copy something, if you control shift V, it will paste it exactly in the space that you picked it up from. So the, what we've done, we've just copied this shape, it's exactly in position for the top bit now. So I'm just gonna lock that layer. So I've clicked there to lock the layer transparency, which means we won't add or remove any pixels, um, but we can change the color of the pixels that are on there. I've just picked a slightly lighter gray. So Alt Backspace, and it's gonna flood fill with our foreground color, which is that color there. Poifect. Just reduce the size of these thumbnails because they're obnoxiously large. So I'm going to do the same thing again. This time I'm going to select this sort of rubber grip section here. So again, I'm going to make a new path set. Guys, you don't have to make a new path set. You can just do everything on one path set. The reason I like to do this is because you can give everything a name. It's very visual and it's easy to understand. Once you guys are gangsters at using Photoshop, just put everything into one path set. It is a pain in the ass, but at least you'll feel good about getting one over on me because I've told you to do something and you don't have to do it that way. So we're gonna go in here. I'm just gonna click and drag. And again, all I'm trying to do is just to get this line inside the um, inside the line of the sketch. So I'm using the sketch as a, a, a guide rather than like slavishly following it. So if it was it was slightly wonk just there, it didn't fit exactly with what I wanted to do. So you see just here, wait a sec, there. So you see this bit just, <laughs> it's so crap, sorry. Uh, this bit is always like a, a bit of a mess. So I just visualized what I wanted the curve to be like and I used the sketch as a guide rather than sort of like obsessively following it. And I've tacked around the outside again. I'm gonna rename that path set handle Pick the selection up from it. Again, go on to shape hole, control C, control shift V. And we get the layer just here. Handle, well, I forgot to rename layer one. Top surface. I'm gonna do the same thing again, lock the transparency, pick a slightly darker color this time. Old backspace to flood fill. So you can see now we've got these nice very accurate shapes, way more accurate than the crappy sketch. So I'm gonna make a new layer, a new path set here called screen. So what I'm gonna do for the screen is I'm gonna do, right, so the screen is, if you can imagine a, a sort of a rounded rectangle, and it's inset by like one millimeter. So I'm gonna visualize the outer rectangle, which is this surface just here, this edge just here, and then the outer one of these two lines, and I'm gonna trace that. I'm gonna use that to create the screen in a minute. Okay, so just bear with me. So again, each time we do this, it's gonna be putting a point down when you go into or transition out of a curve. Or between curves, so that's slightly curved. So following the outer line, and oh, there we go, nearly got it, looks good. Just get right in and look at endpoints. Nice, okay. So because that's a completely integral shape, I'm gonna make a new layer called screen outer. Again, pick a slightly darker color, fill like that. Okay, so you can see that it's starting to come together. 
what I want is I want to have the screen actually inset. So in order to do this, I'm going to use a technique that we've already used. I'm going to click control on here. So when you hold down control and click on the thumbnail for a layer, it picks the, the outline of that layer up as a, trans, uh, um, a selection like this. Now, if I start dragging and moving around now, it moves around what's the pixels that are inside that selection. I don't want to do that. I just want to draw, um, I just want to move around the selection itself. So in order to do that, if I go onto the marquee tool, click M on the keyboard, now when I click and drag, it only moves the selection around. Okay, so it doesn't move around the pixels, it's just moving the selection around on the artboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the selection down so that it is offset to where the actual screen it would be. Then I'm going to click Control C whilst we're on the screen outer layer and then Control Shift V. Boom. And what we've now got is the screen slightly inset. So I'm going to rename that. So we're going to handle that so we can render that so it looks like, you know, like a nice high gloss piece of glass. Okay. So there's a few surface details that I'm going to select. I'm going to rename this um, earpiece because that's what um, this bit here is. Again, it's going to be real simple to do. I just want this to be sort of elliptical. Is that the right? Ellipses are slightly funny beasts to use the Bezier curves to draw. Yeah, that looks fine. Just in case anyone was wondering, the reason why I've not done any breaks to be like, okay, you guys following along okay, is because no one said that they were following along. So if you guys are just going to follow this back at a later date or just watch and chill out, um, we might as well just power on, right? If anyone is following along um, and they're like, wait, what the heck? Then just, um, <laughs> just buzz me to let me know that I'm going a bit too fast. Uh, or to go faster, because I could do that too. It might make you cry, and me too. So we've got a few other bits that we need to look at. Um, this uh, section just here, I'm going to do in a very similar way to the way that I did the um, screen, in that this set of buttons here is kind of inset. I'm going to render them in a particular way. Wait, what's going on? There we go. I think I clicked one of the wrong buttons and it just made the screen go out. Apologies for that. Uh, yeah. But it, at least it didn't last long. The problem is, <laughs> I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to work on these different screens. And I've got Photoshop just here, so when I look at the graphic, it's just there. But I clicked up here to double check on what somebody had posted on one of the chat things. And when I look down, just on this screen just here, I can see the exact same thing, except this one is the stream um, in OBS. So if I click and drag on this, then I go like everywhere. Ooh, I'm moving around. So that's what happens. That's what happened just then. So apologies for that. Anyway, let's, <laughs> let's just stick to Photoshop. It's going to be easier if I only click on things in this. Um, so <laughs> wow, who'd have thought I'd get cabin fever on like day two, right? I'm going to make a new path set down here, and I'm going to just draw the outline of this little sort of inset set of buttons called button set. P on the keyboard, press P on the keyboard, don't P on the keyboard.
And again, where you go in and out of rounded edges like these bits just here. You're going to put your anchor points in there. Let's just check that that's white. Yeah, that looks OK. That looks pretty good. Um, now, this line at the bottom is not parallel to the actual bottom of the handset. So what I can do is, even though I have followed that line pretty well, I need to make sure that when we do this render, that kind of perspective is respected. You've got to respect the perspective, guys. So now is the opportunity to do that. If I try and fix this later on, it won't work. All right, OK, yeah, that looks much better now. So I'm going to make um, buttons outer. And so I'm going to pick up the oh my days, pick up the outline as a selection here. M on the keyboard to select the marquee tool. Drag this down like this. Then I'm going to click C, Control Shift V. We've got the buttons. Lock the transparency for this layer again, this one here. Alt backspace. It's a little bit difficult to see that, so let me pick up a different better color. There we go. So we can see that we've got our little slightly inset buttons just here. Now the actual um, beveling on the buttons I'm going to select using the direct uh, the uh, um, uh, polygonal lasso tool. But we, I feel like we're getting pretty close to having the whole thing sorted. The only thing that we're kind of lacking is we've got these like shut lines from where the object was molded. And this weird little panel just here and these bits just here. So I think what the best way for us to do this now is make a new path set, which is going to be called mouthpiece. Click a P on the keyboard. I'm going to draw one of these little doobie doops, one of these doodads here. So I'm going to click, drag, click and drag. And so I've overlapped just here because I'm actually going to nest this underneath the other section. And I'm going to need to jig this about a little bit so that we can get the exact right kind of perspective for it so that it looks like it is what it's supposed to be. Okay, fine. So that's going to go underneath the buttons, uh, mouthpiece. Slip. Cool. So now what I'm going to do, now that I've got that drawn, is I'm going to click Alt and drag it along like that. And again, and again. And then what I'm going to do is using the cursor keys, just sort of nudge these into shape, into position. So I want them to feel like they are consistent in terms of their position and their distance from each other. And there's lots of different ways that I could do that. I could sort of measure it. But the reality is what I'm going to do is just use it my eyes and eyeball it. Then I'm going to flatten them down one, two, three by clicking Control E. Remember, Control E flattens down two layers. So if you've got two layers, select the top one, Control E, and it will merge them down into a single layer. So now, what was previously four layers is a single layer with that shape on. Um, and 
let's just do it. I'm going to click Control. Picks up the selection there. M. Nudge along like that. And click Control C, Control Shift V. Mouthpiece inset. Lock the transparency. So hopefully that will feel more like, why well, it's not quite there. So the goal is for it to look like they are, there's like a cutaway. This could do with being a little bit subtler than that. C, V. Lock the transparency. Okay, no, that's better. Fine. Oh, it's not quite right. Look, I can't be bothered. Guys, give me a break. I'm going to draw the shut lines now. And we're going to do these as um, paths here. And we're going to do all of them on one layer. So. We're not going to create a closed shape with these. We're just going to have the lines on the artboard. Yeah, these ones might not work in the same way, but we'll just draw them in anyway. Wait, I didn't want to do that. Anyway, there we go. So we've got our shut lines done. We may come back to those later on, kind of depending on how I feel about the way that the overall thing comes together. So look, it looks crap now because what we've done is not create a nice piece of artwork yet. But we've done most of what we need to do in terms of the masking. The masking is the bit that takes a while. So what we're going to do now, we're going to click on each one of these, all of them, and make sure that the transparency is locked for all of them. So that's this button here, lock transparent pixels. That means that we're going to be able to paint onto each one of these and it's going to remain a continuous hole. So click B on your keyboard. Remember, Control and Alt on the keyboard, right mouse button, left and right. We want to have a 0% hardness brush. Push all the way up. As you drag to the right and left, you can change the size. I want. Whenever you're using an airbrush like this, you're going to want to have as big a brush as possible. And what that will mean is that you're going to be able to get a really nice smooth effect. So we'll click D on the keyboard. D is the default color set. Black is the foreground, white is the background. That means that we can swap between them and paint shadows and highlights. If you click X on the keyboard, so D is the default colors. X sort of swaps them, that's how I imagine them swapping over as an X. And I'm going to reduce the opacity of this brush right down to 10%. And we could click on this thing at the top, but remember, guys, if you want to change the opacity of the brush, you just click the number on the keyboard. So I click one on the keyboard, and you can see that the opacity has now jumped to 10%. So I'm going to use this now, painting black, to help me to define this shape in three dimensional space. So let me just hide the handle. So I'm going to 
switch over to highlight to put a kind of sort of background light on. So fill in that space in, if you hold down, click once, hold down shift and click again. We get this nice sort of continuous color. Let's just hide these. I'm just gonna hide all of the surface bits until we need them. So we've got our sort of background. And we've got this locked, so I'm gonna just use a very big brush to create a gradient across it. Shadow a little bit strong like that. So what's nice about this way of working is because it's sort of a little bit iterative, you get to make decisions as you're going along about whether it looks quite right, whether it feels like it's got sort of three-dimensional presence. I think that's easy enough to sort of read as a 3D shape now. So we've got this sort of handly bit just here. I'm going to, again, manipulate the um, layers uh, with a selection so that I can draw a highlight along the top edge. So I've Control, click on there. Click M on the keyboard so that you're moving the selection around. Jog that into place. So if I paint on this layer now, it will only paint inside that selection, but I don't want to paint inside the selection. I want to paint that very fine edge across there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Control Shift I, which is Select Inverse, and now you can see, oh, it's a little bit difficult to spot, everything apart from that shape is selected. So now if I click X on the keyboard, I can paint Highlight, like that. So we've now got this nice front edge to our selection. I can drop in just here. And paint a very slight shadow. So it feels like that machine, uh, that surface is kind of like receding underneath that slight highlight. Just double check. Just step back a few more goes than that. I'm going to use a slightly smaller brush. Still with a very low opacity. Yeah, that's better. Okay, nice. Cool, so that feels like it's got that sort of sense of depth on it. So that's all well and good. This is the inset for the screen, right? So in order to make sure that it reads as that, I wanna have A transition so it goes from one color to another and then with the screen itself again massive brush
I'm going to throw much darker than anywhere else on the artwork. I'm going to draw a line diagonally across it. So we get that kind of screen look, if that makes sense. So hopefully now this reads quite nicely as being a, uh, a screen that's an insert into the artwork. So easy to achieve that effect. And if I wanted, I might duplicate this screen outer. Nudge it slightly this way. So it's underneath. So I'm going to screen outer, highlight, switch to white. So we can get this nice highlight across the front edge just here. So already we've gone from having just this very flat looking artwork to building this sense of sort of physical depth. Earpiece, super easy to do a little inset like this. And reduce the opacity again. I need it to be dark at the top light at the bottom, and the idea is that it reads as a kind of like curved in shape. So as the surface goes along, it dips down into this shape. So it goes down across there. These little mouthpieces just here. Now if the light is coming from up here, diagonally down, these are gonna be cast into shadow. So they're going to be darker than this surface here, which they already are, but also darker than this surface just here because they're more sort of in a cavity. So I'm going to use the brush on this. And again, uh, wrong button. Exactly how far you go with this is entirely dependent on like how it looks when you do it. That's what's nice about this way of doing it, is that there's not like a, a definite way where you have to do it a particular way. Okay, so what I'm going to do is the same thing that I just did um, up there. I'm going to duplicate mouthpiece slip, rename it highlight, nudge them slightly this way, So we get that slight internal highlight just there. Okay, so hopefully you can see that that reads as being kind of inset. And these are, this is where it would kind of catch the light. So look, the geometry of that is not perfect, but you know what? I reckon that looks pretty good. Well, wrong. So I'm going to do the opposite at the top and have these go down to zero so that it's black at the top. So you've got that feeling of it being sort of curved in at the top and then the bottom bit's catching the light. So we've got this weird curve just here versus this hard edge. We're going to deal with that in a minute. Okay, It's one of the techniques that this section is all about. Obviously, we're doing quite a detailed render but I wanted to make sure that you guys saw um, like a load of the different techniques. And we're going to round that corner. We're going to radius that corner in a second, OK? I just want to draw all the surface bits first so that it makes sense when we get around to doing it. So buttons outer. You can see what this is here. This is an inset. So I'm going to use the same approach. Large brush. go across like this. So that it feels like you're like looking into that layer there. So it's pretty good. We've got a sort of some kind of feeling of three dimensional shape here. Right. 
Um, these button bits here are going to be a pain in the neck to do. So we're going to do this in a slightly more freestyle way than we've done the other bits. First of all, I'm going to do an overall kind of um, colouring for it so that it feels like it's got some kind of, like I say, three-dimensional shape, three-dimensional presence before we even start um, adding that structure in. So I'm going to pull this brush all the way down. I'm going to draw a straight line across here. So what I've done is just make sure that it's looking right. On the buttons layer, I'm going to click here, hold down shift, and then click just here. And so whatever brush you've got selected when you do that, it will draw a dead straight line using that brush between those points. So we've got the initial sort of outline of those shapes. And I'm going to select these top bits just here. And so I'm holding down shift when I click these selections because I want to add to the selection that I've already got. Large soft edge brush, low opacity, white foreground color. And I'm going to try and add a little bit of dynamism to them by adding a gradient across them. So a gradient across a flat surface, which just kind of like makes it feel like it's a little bit more alive than it otherwise would. And it's entirely possible that the, what I'm doing now won't look dead perfect first time. And I'm completely comfortable with that because the way that I usually do these renders is like I've said before, it's a slightly iterative process. As we're going along, I'll be like, does that look right? Does that look right? The whole point of what I'm doing is I'm doing it in a way where it's possible to do that. So you don't have to know beforehand exactly how you want it to be. So those are kind of like the highlighted ones. I'm going to add this, 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 and this. Yeah. And here. Uh, nope, because these are in shadow. Nice try, Phil. Nearly uh, buggered it up. Now, come on. That looks pretty slick, right? So what we've got is <coughs> the uh, inset shape. I'm going to just uh, use this brush to cast a kind of shadow around the outside. I'm going to reduce the opacity of the brush, uh, the size of the brush, step it right down, switch to white, and draw over each one of these lines. And what that does is it kind of just like highlights. <coughs> it just highlights them so that they feel slightly sharper. And that way they'll sort of pop a little bit more. Another thing that I want to do is add a slight highlight down there, down there, across there, across there. Put a little farkle, a little highlight at the very peak, and one just there so that it looks nice. Look at that, damn! 
nice. Just imagine. This is a what you've got to do when you're doing these kind of things is that you kind of can imagine now what it would be like to just like put your finger on that. I think that you can just about imagine it. <coughs> so I'm going to switch over to a small uh, black brush again. Okay, look, you don't need to go into this sort of like ridiculous obsessive detail when you're doing these. That is plenty good enough. Um, what I'm going to do again, just the exact same thing, button out a copy, switch that to highlight. So that bit that I've just selected is the um, this outside bit. And again, by nudging it and jogging it down like here, B, switch to a large white brush. So when I paint across here, we can get this nice sort of sharp edge. We will deal with this, this bit here, look, we need to deal with this. Um, so I'm going to unlock the transparency for the highlight layer. I'm going to pull the brush size right down and see if this works. Yeah, pretty good. So now we've got the little breaks here in the highlight. I'm going to relock that. So I reckon that little um, button set there is that was quite a successful little bit of clicking about. So in terms of the details that are left to do, we've got the shut lines. Um, we can do these little insets just here. This bit here with these little curves, that's something that is going to make a difference to how the um, render looks. So we're going to cover that first of all. Um, let me just real quick check. We've got nine people watching live at the moment, which is not a million miles away from how many we'd have in the um, studio in the Graham Sutherland building. If you are online now, uh, do me a favor and just like chime in, check in if everything that I've done so far makes sense. Uh, Someone left a real positive message on one of the things the other day, and I was like, I felt good about it in the comments. And then when I clicked on their name, I'm like, I am 100% certain that it's a bot and it's some kind of marketing thing. So if you're a bot, listen, I'm so not fussy. If you leave a positive comment as a bot, it's now's the best time as a bot. Uh, so what we didn't do, we didn't make path sets for these little bits just here. So it's a little bit of a pain to use the path to make them, but it is the easiest way to make a nice accurate mask. Because so far we've created artwork that has got an extremely accurate mask. I'm going to make a new path set just here and it's going to be called Grip. So let's just reduce the opacity of the sketch line uh, one more time. So now it's more than ever, it's just a very loose guide. Grip. I haven't got anything exciting to say whilst I'm doing this, but I'm just, just going to leave you hanging for a sec.
Nice, right, so we've got them. Uh, mm, don't love that last one. Okay, they look pretty whack, but nonetheless, we are going to make a uh, selection from them. Click on the handle bit. Control C, Control Shift V, just like before. That's going to be called handle grip. I'm going to click B on the keyboard so we get the brush. Hide the sketch layer again. Reduce the opacity. Make sure that we've got the default colour set. I'm just going to... Hmm. Mess around with that for a sec. Okay, that's about right for what I want. And I'm going to duplicate that, drag it underneath, call it handle grip, highlight, deselect, Go across like this. You can always reduce the opacity of that so that we've got some sense of that grip across the back just there. So we've got everything done so far in terms of the geometry. It's all very nice and crisp. We don't have our shut lines really represent it. So, this is a little bit of a pain to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer above shape hole, which is going to be called shut lines one. And I'm going to imagine that I'm going to draw a line using a brush. So how would it look? What brush would I use? So I'm going to have black foreground color, 100% opacity, 100% hardness, and a small brush. That's going to let us make a like a real crisp line. Okay. So rather than right, this is a, the weird bit. So rather than um, making a layer. Right. I need you guys to control click, uh, well, just control click or double click on, um, turns out it's double click on this version, on this button just here. This is the quick mask tool, and you need to have color indicates selected areas, okay? So we're going to click it so that we're in quick mask mode. You can do that by clicking Q on the keyboard as well. So what happens now is we're going to paint selection. So if I just draw now, you'll notice that it's red, even though I'm painting black. When we come out of quick mask, what we painted is now a selection. Okay, We've painted a selection. It was our way to make a quick mask. Quick mask. So go into quick mask. Make sure you've got your shut lines layer uh, path set selected, and you've got shut lines set just here. Right? This is getting weird. Shut line set just here. And we're going to, instead of hitting this button here, fill path with foreground color, we're going to hit this button here, stroke path with brush. Right. So what we've got now in the quick mask and using the um, selection, uh, uh, stroke path with brush, we've now made this shape. And when we come out of quick mask, That stuff is all selected, right? So now if we use a brush that is more appropriate for doing the kind of thing that we want to do, so 
just to make sure it looks in the right position in the lab. We can paint in a way that will create those shirt lines. So just need to make sure that that shirt lines is in actually in the right position so that it goes over everything that we need it to. If you ever got selections and you're painting inside selections and you want to paint um, but not see the selections, if you click Control H, those selections are still selected, but it hides them. Okay, so that's nice. Here's the cool thing. If you click M now, we can move those selections around. So if we slightly offset them, so I've offset them to the side and down a little bit. Now when we paint, if you paint with a highlight, you can paint with a highlight for the shut line. And it looks like you've got the let's get it in the right position. Oh my wife, that's annoying. No, there we go. So we've got the the correct kind of shape to suggest the edge of that line. Does that make sense? I, real, I realize that that's like quite a complicated technique, but it's the idea of being able to make a selection using the, um, the selected tool, uh, using this uh, make paths from the selection, and then using that quick mask to paint inside it. Yeah, actually, wait a second, it's just super complicated. But it's really effective and it's a very quick way of creating things like this. So you can see that we've got these nice edges just here. So we talked a bit about how this extremely sharp edge doesn't quite work visually because we've got this curves just here, we've got this curve just here. and on an object like this, it wouldn't necessarily be molded as being an exact, exact sharp edge, right? So what I'm gonna do is, first of all, I'm gonna get this top edge, top surface and shape hole, and I'm gonna just put them right together. I'm gonna to duplicate both of them. So we've got top surface, shape, hole, copy. I'm going to flatten them together, so I've got, I'm just going to put overall as the name of that layer. So what we've now got is we've got both of them, but they're on a single layer. Okay, so I'll just hide those. Right. So that's one layer, which has got this top surface and this bit here. What's important about this is now that if we do a filter or something to this now, it will affect the, set, the surface, the content, all of the pixels inside this um, outline, but not the outline itself, because we've locked the transparency. So if I go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, Gaussian blur, then it affects, you can see it affects this transition, but not the silhouette. So the outside of the shape still is beautifully masked. And by adjusting the radius of the blur, you can adjust the radius of that edge. So we can either have one which is very sharp, and then as we move across here, you can even end up with something which is almost sort of like round and pebble-like. And this is a brilliant way of creating these very soft surfaces, but not just that, but also it might be the point where somebody's like, can you just come up with a few visuals where we wanna see what will it look like if we've got a three mil, five mil, eight mil, and 12 mil fillet, like a bevel around the outside here. This is the perfect way to do it.
because just like we just click and slide just here, you can just immediately see what it's going to look like. And so what I want to do is I want to match this curve to the radius that I've implied with this shape just here. OK. Boom, look at that. I really like that. I think it's worked quite nicely. Now, if you were going to be producing a piece of artwork like this using an actual airbrush or any one of another different analog ways, then you might want to put like a nice, like a nice drawn line around the top just there, uh, this edge at the front here. But that's quite difficult to do if you're using Photoshop, especially if you're not using a graphics tablet. I've actually got a graphics tablet machine, but because I know that I've already got one, the way that I'm showing you to do this uses the mouse. So I'm going to show you a really nice way of getting a nice organic feel for that kind of surface, but using the mouse. And it uses a technique that we've just touched on. So if we click on front surface here, you can see that we've got that front surface there. Let me just deselect. I actually want that path there. So I'm going to have a soft edge brush around about the size that I want my swoosh to be. So a nice soft edge brush, swoosh sized. 0% opacity, uh, hardness, 100% opacity, black as the foreground colour. We're going to go into Quick Mask again. I'm going to make a new, actually wait, I'm going to make a new layer called Swoosh, or Swoosh Highlight or something. Let's put that on top of everything else. So we're in Quick Mask. Q on the keyboard. I'm going to draw using the button at the bottom here, stroke path with brush, come out of quick mask, Let's just deselect that, and now with a large soft edge brush with a low opacity, set to white, I can paint a nice soft highlight in at the front here. So that looks really nice and like it pops, that front surface pops now really nicely because we drew that highlight in. Okay, so I think that looks nice, that looks pretty good. Let's drop that underneath the shut lines. It's not any kind of round time. Why would my clock make that noise? Anyway, whatever. So look, because we've got this rounding technique that we've just ex uh, experimented with, if I've got the handle here, this handle has actually got this artwork on it. So if I blur the handle slightly, whilst it's got the transparency locked, blur, Gaussian blur, then you see I can control exactly how radius the edge of that is. So we've got now this really, like, I think it looks really nice. It's got this real great sense of three dimensional depth. So I'm going to collapse all of this into a folder which I'm going to call geometry. And I'm going to, although I've not done this yet, make sure you guys do this a lot. I'm going to just save this sensor device at 2020 AM. Boom. So I'm going to add some colour to this. So I'm going to click on the outline here, hold down control, remember guys, and click on this layer. And what I want to remove from this layer is the screen. Uh, this uh, selection is the screen, the handle, and the buttons. So I'm holding down control and alt. So now if I go make a new adjustment layer, hue and saturation, colorize, important. I can pick an appropriate sort of a color for this object. So let's go with a nice safety orange.
So that looks pretty good, pretty, um, pretty nice. If I wanted to add a texture to this, you guys know that I love the photographic texture. Let me just drag this out of the geometry because it's not geometry, it's color. Let's go into Bing, which I had a second ago. I've been trying to be prepped. I've got all of my folders and my windows. There we go, let's just drag it over here. Um, Bing. Uh, I'm not sure what texture I would put on this. ABS plastic texture? Nice, look at that guys. That's pretty much perfect. Copy image. Is that a tile? Will that the image tile? Now, if you were here for the other session, we went through a technique for making a um, tiling texture. Unfortunately, it looks like whoever made this texture has already made a tiling texture for us. So, and it, and yeah, it's not quite perfect, but it's close enough. So what I'm going to do is let's see whether this works. Fill this layer with our plastic texture. Yeah, nice. Set that to overlay. Pick up that transparency and create a layer mask from it. We can always reduce the... Um... Right, that was awesome, wasn't it? I love it. So let me just double check whether we're actually back on. Great. Listen, now, I think we're back. Who would have thought that sending literally everybody in the country home and saying work from home and watch Netflix, who would have thought that that would have <laughs> any adverse effect whatsoever on how well our network infrastructure works? Right. Um, Thank you, anybody who managed to stay. Man, look at that. We lost almost everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're back. So apologies to anybody who um, dropped off then. That was, uh, I don't know, let's say BT's fault. So, <laughs> right, before we got um, before we got so rudely interrupted by uh, everything, what I was looking at was just went on Bing and I just searched screw heads. Because what I want to do is, I want to find a really nice um, photograph of a screw head. Um, let me just, I can see, yeah, the network condition's fine. Um, so I'm gonna put uh, Philips screw head, that's my screw head. So what I want is one that looks like it would be suitable for putting in place on our um, object. So flat, and I want one that's sort of more or less the right angle. Okay, and the one that I want is let's say, boom, that one, right? I'm just going to copy that image, paste it directly into Photoshop. You use the elliptical marquee tool holding down Alt. I'm going to click Control C and then V. And now we've got a screw head. I'm going to drag that into position. I'm going to duplicate it so that we can work on making sure that they're all correct. I'm 
that's about right. So what I want to do is make sure that the minor axis of the ellipse of the screw is pointing sort of in the right direction. And that will change for each one of these. More or less there. Just line everything up. So it feels like they're all sort of integrated in the right sort of way. Flatten them all down, control E. And then I'm going to put a very slight drop shadow on each one. So actually, there's a couple of different things that we could do now, depending on how we wanted this to look. We can either put a very subtle drop shadow on each one of them with a minimal distancing, a minimal size. That way they kind of feel like they're sitting proud of the surface. Or I can use the bevel and emboss, outer bevel, down, light coming from up here, minimum depth, lower the size down, and that way we'll feel a little bit more like they are sort of recessed, sort of inset. I think I like that one slightly more. So here we go, we've got texture, we've got some sort of photographic uh, screw heads, Let me just get rid of that. I'm gonna make a background which is going to be white, big soft edge brush, we've got a gradient across the background, so I'm just holding down shift and drag in, and I'm going to make a shadow so I've got my big soft edge brush, set it to 100% opacity. This is a bit of a weird one, guys. Let's just hide this so you can see exactly what I'm doing and the screws. So I'm on the shadow layer. I'm just gonna click once in the middle. Show everything again. Control T to distort that sort of blob that I did. Hold down Shift. reduce the opacity a little bit. And I think that's about it. So let's just put these in a folder called background. Let's put these in a folder called texture or material, material. And um, I think there we go. I think that the, we've. I think we've done it. I think. I think we're geniuses. I think we're the best Photoshop rendering team in the world. I don't know if you agree, but it's just kind of how I feel at the moment. So <laughs> we've been through. Uh, look, guys, we've been through a lot together. Um, We've covered absolutely shed loads of stuff. So let me just, I'm going to do like, this is the recap. It. Um, we've used the pen tool to create the masks. We created individual layers for each of the separate surfaces. And we did that in a bunch of different, slightly over complicated ways. We um, rendered them using the airbrush method. So we had a very low opacity, 
large soft edge brush. Then we put way too much detail on the surface of the object. We used a polygonal lasso tool to make this um, button section just here. We masked everything and made a color. We added some texture. We used, this is the uh, perhaps the bit that I should have spent ages and ages explaining. But if you use a path where you want to draw a nice smooth line, you can use the add stroke to path whilst you're in quick mask. And then you can paint over the top of that so you get a beautiful smooth look, even if you're using the mouse. So those are, I guess, the main takeaways from this. Again, um, the network fell over and we just got booted off YouTube, which was sub-optimal. But we got there. Um, anyone who's stuck through, that's great. If you <laughs> if you if you followed along with this, and uh, the chances are they're slim. Come on, let's let's face it, they're slim. If you followed along, um, I would love to see a. Um, screeny of the work that you've done. So if you're one of my students, then you can jam that into the Discord. If there's something that you want me to cover in a future session, um, either in the Discord, if you ask it down in the comments down below, I'm going to try and do another session where we're going to run through this um, same technique in a slightly different way this afternoon, but it's more or less the same. If you watch now, don't come back and watch it this afternoon. You'll just be bored as hell. Um, if the stream, apart from when it broke down, has been okay, can you just leave me a message somewhere to tell me that, it, that when it was working, it was working okay, volume okay, um, so that you can follow along visually, even if you didn't necessarily follow along. If anybody has got any questions outside of the scope of doing um, this very specific render, then feel free to ask in any one of the other channels that we've managed to uh, maintain. If you've got a question, ask me on my email. If you're one of the students at the university, ask me on the Discord. Other than that, I'll see you guys real soon. If you've got any, I'm going to post a link to, we've got the link in the thing to this bit of artwork. Um, follow along. I'm going to put a link to um, the course as well. So a few people on the other, um, when I did this earlier on, sent me emails because they're just sort of like rando somewhere in the world and they didn't know what course I was teaching on. If you're, <laughs> when it goes back, if you are thinking about taking up product design, then the um, the product design course that I occasionally teach on is really good. So I'll put a link in about that. Um, but obviously it's not running at 100% uh, at the moment because <laughs> everyone's, everyone's away dealing with coronavirus. But listen, um, thanks for tuning in. If you have indeed tuned in, Stay safe, you guys, and um, we will uh, reconvene very soon. That's it. Bye-bye.